34. Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. In order to keep the show going through 2024 and beyond, we need a hundred Patreon subscribers. With 100 Patreon subscribers, that guarantees that the show will be financially stable and I'll be able to bring you content for years to come. For less than a pack of Cinco's or a jackhammer chatterbait, you'll receive a special monthly discount off of all your orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, whether in-store or online. You'll be entered in weekly prize giveaways that are only for our Patreon members. You'll have access to members-only content and access to our private Facebook community. And also, you can be proud that you're the reason that this show keeps going. Fishing in the DMV was created for the people that live in this great area, and it's almost it's only fitting that it's because of the people of this area that this show keeps going. If you feel like you can help keep this show going well into the future, link in the episode description down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. Today, we got a really special guest. We have Christine Bradley on the show. Um, I really wanna have a huge shout out to Mr. Steve Chaconis. Um, Honestly, I've gotten, the show has gotten to that weird apex where I can't keep track of all the guests. So I really enjoy when people actually reach out to me, bug me a little bit to make sure I get them because I, do everything myself. So organizing guests and stuff is getting a little chaotic here. And this is an absolutely fascinating conversation that we're going to have today. Uh, I mean, really, how did you, how did all this start for you, you in this world of fishing? Hey, and yeah, I want to thank Steve too, for, for suggesting that you have me on and actually turning me on to your show. I mean, I've been listening to some of the show, the, uh, the podcast and like John Odenkirk. I mean, dude, rock star, right? Yeah. I mean, wouldn't it be great if every fishery had a John Odenkirk? I mean, I just, I want to get comfortable in my career enough where I feel like I can say whatever I want. And it's like, I got tenure. What are you going to do? I just, I love that about about him. (laughs) Right. Yeah, absolutely. But very good stuff. I, um, so I'm really enjoying listening to the show. So thank you for having me on. Um, so yeah, you asked, how did I get into this? Right. Um, so my brother, you know, he, he, um, he's loved fishing since he was real young. And, um, I didn't really start fishing that much until, you know, my teens, um, with him and, uh, and he got me, he got me hooked, (laughs) um, you know, in my late teens, um, he was fishing some local tournaments and stuff. And, and, uh, he took me out, let me fish a a couple times with him on the Rappahannock river. And, uh, he had an old Stratus with, I think it was a 48 Johnson back in the day. And, uh, and we, um, we fished the his and hers tournament together and won it and fished another one and won it. <laughs> so, and, you know, we got to fish with some of the like legends on the Rappahannock river. And I learned so much in that, in that time. And, um, so I've been, that was back in the early two thousands. The Rappahannock is interesting because even like, you know, I my, my show is called Fishing the DMV and I, and I try to get information on all the bodies of water that you could fish. And it's like Phil Pot and the Rappahannock, there, there's just a couple places where they're mysteries. It, unless you know somebody, it, it's hard to get information about them. It is. It is. And I think um, with the Rappahannock, I can say that, you know, it's a it's a Oxbowy River, you know, and uh and so it, I don't know. I think it, it, it has to do with it being so close to like Lake Anna and the Potomac. Like there's so many, you know, opportunities for people to, to catch fish on, on those bodies of water. And, and it's kind of like, you know, um, those draw a lot more boats than, than the Rappahannock does, which works well for me because, you know, <laughs> having a place that doesn't have a lot of pressure is uh, kind of rare. So, yeah. Would you consider the Rappahannock, because th- this show is all about rabbit holes, um, and would you consider the Rappahannock, does it fish more like the Potomac or the James? What kind of tidal body, for people that are listening that have never been there, what is it yeah. more like? I would liken it more to um, the James, like a uh, you know a smaller version, obviously, of the James, maybe like the Chick, um, you know, just a, a narrower version of the James, um, and, um, you know, it doesn't have some of the cool features that the chick has with the cypress trees and stuff like that. But, um, but yeah, it's, I'd say it's closer to that than the Potomac. 
Interesting. And yeah, it's like, yeah, I really want to get more information about that thing and, and really kind of delve into it because it's such a fascinating fishery right there near Fredericksburg. But so yeah. your origins, really, your what what made up, I guess, the backbone, because every angler, the places that they fish when they're younger create kind of their style, their DNA. So it sounds like your shallow water, dirty tidal fisheries, that's kind of what developed your skills in the beginning, correct? Definitely. And, and you know, when I started fishing the majors, um, it was an interesting uh, kind of opposite problem that most from what, what most of the guys that were fishing the majors had. So, you know, I was used to dirty, shallow tidal water. And, uh, and so fishing those deep, you know, uh, clear water reservoirs and stuff um, was, um, or, uh, you know, the river systems um, was just a big challenge for me to learn. Um, and then for those guys coming out to fish tidal water on the, on the Potomac river, it was, you know, the opposite for them. It was challenging for those, those guys cause they had never fished tidal water, right. A lot of them, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's sort of how I, you know, how I first learned and uh, you know, fishing Lake Anna back in the day, um, was always challenging. And so I told myself like, um, you know, when I first started fishing the, the women's Bassmaster tour, you know, traveling to Texas and Arkansas and stuff like that, like, um, I said, okay, when I'm at home, I need to stop fishing the rivers and go, you know, go concentrate on Lake Anna or, or another, you know, tough body of water like that as it was back then. Um, because I knew that by learning how to catch fish on, on the, these lakes at home, I could, I could better, do better, you know, out on the road. So, um, but yeah, that's, I'm a, that's, yeah, a that's, river that's, rat. <laughs> that boom, that that's the great segue to my thought where it is hard for, I think a lot of anglers here that want to break out that either grow up on the James or the Potomac where you get that river rat kind of labeling and it's a lot different than when you go to a Kerr or let's say Lake Anna, where now it's live scope and 30 feet of water. And it can really hurt you if you don't branch out and diversify your skill portfolio. 100%. And yeah, and being versatile is, is so critical, but it can also um, hurt you, you know, to, because it, it, you know, I think a lot of us, at least I shot myself in the foot a lot by, suffering from FOMO, you know, before the days of, of scoping and stuff like, um, you know, you just feel like if I don't try all the techniques, I'm missing, I must be missing something. And, you know, and then you end up not, you know, and then the ADD kicks in and you're kind of all over the map, you know, <laughs> but, um, but, it, and I'm also just like a sponge, like I, I love learning all, all the things. Um, and, uh, I love troubleshooting. That's what I do in my career. And, uh, so like, I, I want to try all the things, you know, and, uh, you know, so it, that, that was one of the biggest challenges for me and, um, and competing with at that opens level was, uh, just zeroing in on the techniques I was going to focus on, you know. Now, and I really want to also touch on that. What you said earlier on the majors and then the opens at that time, was that two separate trails and was it the majors first then the opens or was that the same thing? No, I'm just like, I think I, I'm referring to the majors more like um, that level of fishing, the open level of fishing, yeah, sure. you know, okay. um, I fished, um, you know, some, um, more, they were called the um, Ever Starts or the, you know, the FLW open okay. level tournaments and, and the Bassmaster open level tournaments after the bat, uh, after the women's Bassmaster tour ended. That's where I, I shifted my focus. I fished a lot of the weekend series tournaments too on the Potomac River and uh, and had some pretty good, good times there. I, I met so, I mean, I fished against some of the, like the, the guys that fished the Potomac back then, you know, and the, you know, 2005 fish, 2010, you know, time frame when it was just on fire. Um, some of the most incredible fishermen in the, in the country, I think I feel really like they helped elevate my, my skills, you know, cause you could, if you're going to compete, I mean, you're just handing them your money unless you're going to figure out how to catch them against those guys, you know? Um, but yeah, absolute so that's what I mean. hammers. yeah, absolute hammers. So yes. what, what happened mindset wise where you're fishing, you're fishing with your brother and then you, you, you eventually get into the opens, but there's a transition period. There's a step process there mentally. When did you decide that? Okay. I want to start climbing up this ladder. Yeah, it was, it was a pretty easy thing for me. Um, it, you know, we, my, 
um, brother and I and my um, would be husband, you know, uh, we, I met my husband, when we were fishing um, against each other in, in local clubs and uh, like the LAPR, you've heard of that, you know, uh, on the Lake Anatomic river. And, um, and uh, so that's where we met. And then we started dating, we were engaged. And, and when the Bassmaster classic happened at, in Pittsburgh, my brother and I, and my husband went, went to the uh, classic. And uh, when we went to the expo, there was a, a kiosk there that had the women's Bassmaster tour um, announced, you know, that it was starting the following year and it had ESPN, you know, that backed by ESPN. And uh, man, we were like, Hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> and I had thought about, uh, you know, fishing the, the uh, bass and gals or something like that prior to that, but I just, all of those tournaments were too far away to justify the expense and everything. So, um, so yeah, my brother and I, my husband, um, talked about it and my husband encouraged me to take his truck and his boat <laughs> at the time because I didn't have one. Cool. Yeah. And, um, and so we, we went together to Louisville, Texas and, and I competed in the first, you know, women's bass transfer tour event. And, and, uh, it was all over after that. I, I competed in every single event they had, um, the, you know, and ended up getting sponsored by Geico. I had, uh, you know, uh, wrapped Triton and, That's um, so cool. I, yeah, I ended up getting my own boat after, after that and, uh, got to travel a lot. And, um, uh, unfortunately he didn't get to go with me all the time, but he had to work, you know, um, but uh, but yeah, I got to compete in that for I think it was four years. What, so then, what was that first tournament like, though? Emotion, like, was this your first time, like, like big tournament wise? Let's take that out of it. Was this your first time fishing that area of the country? Oh yeah, uh, like I'd fish a lot of tournaments, you know, and um, but they were all you know DMV, right, um, and and just club tournaments and stuff, um, but. I guess we had also, we had fished, um, the furthest away I think I'd fished was like uh, in a tournament was Lake Norman. Um, we had a national bass circuit regional championship. My husband and I were a team back then and, and we qualified for that. So, um, uh, so yeah, it was definitely the first time I'd like even traveled to that part of the country, you know? Um, and what was it like? I mean, exciting, I guess. I felt like I was, you know, out of my element a, a bit uh, and over my head, but, um, always up for a challenge. So, um, I figured it was worth a try. A lot of the, I mean, it was cool. We had over a hundred female boaters and, you know, um, a match field on the co-angler side in the first year. And, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of really good female anglers out there, you know, um, but the, the numbers started to dwindle. So that's what kind of ended that. When did the numbers start to dwindle with that? Or let me back up some more. Was was the peak right at the beginning and then it, and it slowly tapered? Or what was the heyday, would you consider, for that? Yeah, it was, it was definitely at the beginning, you know, and, and I think it was, it had a lot to do with ESPN backing the, the thing, you know, and um, it probably a year and a half. The first year was good. Um, and then the second year, I think our numbers, you know, were in the 80s or something like that. And as far as the number of boats and, and it just kind of started to dwindle from there. Um, I, I think we, we were still getting like 65, 70 boats or whatever in the third year. Um, but then, um, when the ESPN backing went away and, you know, uh, Bass, I think Bass made a good business, business decision that they couldn't justify the expense to, to, you know, to host us, um, because we didn't have the numbers. Right. So, um, so, but that's when I, you know, when that ended, I still had my sponsorship with Geico. And, uh, and so I said, well, I talked to my husband and said, what, what am I going to do? You know? And, and I thought, you know, uh, Bass gave us the opportunity to, um, get early registration for the opens that year, which was really, they didn't have to do that. And I think it pissed a lot of people off actually, you know, cause it's like, why did we get this advantage just cause we're girls? But, um, that was another problem with the tour. Right. Um, they, they added a spot in the classic um, and that didn't seem fair to the, to the guys who had to put three times as much money in to, to make it to that, you know, uh, Super Bowl. So, um, so there was just a lot uh, stacked against us, I think. Um, but then, yeah, I, I jumped at the chance to compete in the opens. Um, so, you know, I knew if I wanted to really 
have a go at it. I had to, I had to step my game up, you know? It is funny that you mentioned that because when, um, when, when MLF bat, bought FLW and they didn't honor a lot of those obligations uh, for the previous tours, people were all up in arms. But now it's almost yeah. like reverse where when Bass closes your tour down, they're trying to honor things a little bit. And people are up in arms. It's it, You can't make people happy anyway. People complain just to complain, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. And of course, they're in it to make money. So, I mean, it's it's business and pe- people have to have to acknowledge that, you know, on some level. Step, stepping away just from the journey in the open, just in general, going from a DMV angler, you're fishing local bodies of water that you do have tons of experience on. And now you're this touring pro. <laughs> when did you feel like, and maybe you didn't have this issue, but when did you feel like you hit your your comfort stride when it came to practicing just the the, the new lifestyle of hitting all these new bodies of water? Did you feel like you did get in a groove? And, and what was that like? Um. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, it it was, I'm really good at beating myself up. So I have to put, put in my time and put in the time of like three other people. So like I, I probably, you know, if I had to look back on it, I probably went overboard with the time on the water and the, and the, you know, um, uh, putting pressure on myself to, to do well. And, and that was, that was a recurring theme for a long time, but you know, it was, I I think it was also this, I felt like there was this expectation of failure from me because I'm the girl, you know, and I was oftentimes in the bottom third of the, of the uh, results and that sucked. So I brought, I would sometimes bring that into the next practice. And if I'm not catching on, like, you know, Mm -hmm. it's a self, self self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Um, It can be. So, um, but I worked hard to overcome that and, and to build confidence and, and not think, you know, people don't give a damn what I'm doing. So, you know, it was just me against the fish. So um, I think it was, it was really a gradual thing that happened over time. Like um, when I would, you know, go to, uh, pull up to the hotel at one of these uh, lakes that didn't have many hotels, you know, there's 50 boats lined up, you know, up against the, the motel <laughs> and I've got to find a spot and the guys are out there chatting it up with each other and stuff. And I did not fit in, didn't really feel comfortable trying to, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, I, my husband wasn't with me, so it wouldn't have looked right anyway. Right. So, um, so I was kind of on my own, which I love, um, but it's also a disadvantage, right? I didn't have a practice partner um, most of the time. Some sometimes there were females that were um, competing on the co-angler side, or or a co-angler I had from a previous tournament would you know be good enough to go out with me um, and practice. So so it was kind of like I, I like to make it harder on myself than it probably needed to be. Um, but um, the stride thing was I I, I wanted it right. So um, I would use some of those challenges, I think, to drive me to just figure it out and, you know, try to, if that makes sense, like, you know, um, it was, it was just thriving on the challenge. Right. Um, so over, over the course of the time I was doing it, I think that some of the guys I was competing against saw that I was putting my time in and that I wasn't, uh, trying to shortcut anything. And, um, and, they knew that I could catch fish and I think I started to earn some respect. Um, and that's when I feel like it, I started to hit my stride, I guess, is when I felt like I belonged there. Right. Um, so it took a long time, (laughs) probably, probably five or six years doing it before I felt like that. The the mental side of fishing is insane because it gets down to like golf or baseball. Um, I usually think baseball is a better analogy because, you know, a a good baseball, a, a good batter will go, you know, if he has a 200, 300 batting average, that's great. But then you look at that through a season, that's a lot of failure just to have considered being successful. Um, and, and I really just like to, I love the mental side of the fishing and people's decisions. And so really let's compare and contrast your practice on, on the women's league. And then you make the, the adjustments to bass, like you just stated, and then the yips kind of come in the noise. Did you have that kind of noise on when you were on the woman's trail when you first started or was it differently, the voices in your head? And did that um, like that kind of like showed in performance and things like that? Yeah, I think um, the looking back, the the pressure I put on myself was no different, but the chatter was different. Like the mm. the 
the negativity that you felt was different. Um, I wasn't part of any of the cliques because I was from Virginia. Most of those girls were from Texas and down south. And and some of them, I mean, I made a lot of good friends fishing that, that uh, tour. And, and some of the other girls were also kind of outside any cliques. And, and we get, you know, got to be great friends with some people. Um, so the negativity that I felt there was more about like a, more of a catty kind of, you know, the way girls can be <laughs> quite frankly, we didn't do a great job of banding together and networking with each other unless you were part of those little cliques, I think, but as a large organization, I don't think we did well with that. Um, so I think that the, the situation was different. And, it, and so when I moved into competing against the guys, it was just like, it was an intense difference in the way it felt, but it was like adrenaline, like um, pressure and, um, and you know, just the desire to do well, you know, and to be able to hang with them was, was there. Um, but, but I never sensed, I never got any kind of negativity from them. You know, it's just kind of like, I wasn't, I didn't exist, which is cool with me <laughs> until I did well. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I just, I've always found that the sports psychology, again, like so interesting where regardless either tour you're competing against the fish and then whether yeah. you're competing in any other sport where you, let's say you're away and the crowd's rowdy, you still got to play the sport, but sure. it's how we put pressure on ourselves mentally. And that's just so fascinating where we do. And then there's sometimes there's always, a, a, you know, exemptions to the rule, but we just screw ourselves over mentally over yeah, yeah. whatever sport. And I think people yeah. can learn a lot about that. Yeah, absolutely. And and that I think is the biggest message that I want to share with the girls who are, are fishing in college or considering fishing, you know, at that level um, is, you know, about how to do it anyway, you know, and how important it is to do it anyway. And, um, and, you know, I, I am extremely confident now, you know, in my abilities. Um, I know how difficult it is to finish in the top 10 in a major, you know, an open or something. Um, I've been there, you know, uh, the guys that do it consistently. And I say guys purposely, um, are just, next level, you know, they are the elites or, you know, the best of the best. So, um, you know, it, I, I, I told Rick Pierce when, um, I moved from Bass Cat to, to Ranger, uh, got lucky enough to be sponsored by Bass Pro a couple of years ago. Um, I said, you know, if I was going to, uh, make the elite series, it would have been, would have happened by now, you know, but there was always that chance. I had a good, eight, uh, good fourth place finish in um, Bassmaster Open on uh, Douglas Lake, and I was like, "Man, I can do this. I can win one of these," you know. And uh, so I knew I, I'm a realist. I knew that if it was going to happen, it would have happened. And um, you know, I, um, I think I, I can just make a better use of my time by doing other things with my, you know, sort of, um, knowledge that I've gained over the years, if that makes sense, instead of continuing to, to go after that dream, I guess. I want you to hit on that one thing. You had that really good fin finish at, um, <clears throat> Lake Douglas and you kind of hinted at, well, I belong because I, I had that win. I hit that Homer. My God, is that important? And this is something I tell, you know, when I used to work with young athletes for a living, it's so important. No, it doesn't matter the, the level of the competition. You need to have some kind of success to feel like you actually belong there. And there's so yeah. many people that are in the fishing world that they say like, well, I got to go fish the absolute elite level. The problem is if you're not ready and you get your ass kicked 24 seven, it hurts you mentally. My yes. brother and I in high school wanted to go fish a lot of the, the Potomac River, Potomac team stuff. The problem is you're fishing against guys that have fished that river for 200 years. Yes. And I, I swear, I my brother and I didn't think we were good. Then we go fish high school and college. And you're like, oh, once it's amongst our peers, we don't suck. And right. Please don't think if you're a young angler that you have to initially go fish the best, the best. You know, right. your performances will tell you when it's time to make that step to the next level. Yeah. Sure. And, and your, but your, um, your, your mind, you know, can, can screw you over and, and cause you to, to never, 
make that move too sometimes i think you know um by you know if you don't have the confidence and you don't um have the support system and stuff like that um i think i think a lot of people can say you know what i'm just not good enough and that's that's a shame because mm -hmm. you know and and that's what, to me when i went to the opens i was like i don't know if i can do it my brother knew i could do it my husband did um and uh and I did it, you know, I mean, um, I, I won a little bit of money and, um, and, but I was there, you know, and the, the fact that I did it was mm -hmm. the win. Right. I think. Um, and I got to fish and buy his water that I would never dream of, of going to, you know, to for vacation and had some of the most incredible like experiences and memories of doing that stuff. So, um, I wouldn't change it. Do you think the opens are harder? And I, this question's probably been asked about 6,000 times on God knows how many shows. Do you think the opens are harder to qualify for the, the elites than let's say the Toyotas back in the day for the FLW or, or something like that? You know, I only fished a couple, uh, like it was ever starts back in the day that the, you know, the FLW open level tournaments um, on the Potomac. I fished one on the St. Lawrence river and I actually had like 18 and a half pounds on the first day. And I was like in, you know, the top 15 or something. Um, somebody was on my drift on the second day, but I mean, that's how it goes, you know? And, and I didn't want to, I probably could have gotten in there because several people were running that drift. And I was just like, I'm not going to win that way, man. You know? Um, but so I guess my, my answer would be, I don't think I competed in enough of the, um, the MLF FLW type, um, events to really be able to say um i think that um uh, at that time when i was you know in the in the 20 you know 2005 2012 15 whatever time frame um the opens were just a stacked field you know and and the flw side was more uh it wasn't as much you know there were obviously like some of the best anglers in the in the world in that one too but um so i think maybe um the flw might have been easier to to consistently do well in um but i'm not sure yeah i just always found that fascinating that because like with the opens it's such a you're compete so many anglers are competing for such few spots. It I I've yeah. always wondered how much the luck comes into involved. And what I mean by luck, guys, for the people listening, is just your season has to be insane. It is it, baseball terms, it's a perfect game. And when you think yeah. of it that way, it, it's incredible when some of these guys do pull it off. Um, yeah. more like John Cox, in my opinion, when he just does it for fun and he yeah. really has to win money. It's like you're yeah. obsessed. Yeah, I, and and that's the thing, is like you got to have, you got to be the total package. You got to have the mindset and the skills and the luck, I guess. Um, but some guys don't seem like they need the luck at all. Cause they're, they're always right there. You know what I mean? Um, and those are the guys that end up with, in the, uh, in the real majors. <laughs> what lakes on the open and then, um, on, on the woman's trail, really, did you feel like were your bread and butter? I'm assuming at that time period, the opens went to the James, correct? Um, so the opens were not going to the James, um, until recently I did well. And uh, the last two James river opens and, you know, um, I think in the top 30, both, both times, which I think is damn good. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, when I was fishing the women's tour, probably the name, the river, the place that stands out to me the most is the red river go figure. Right. Yeah, right. Um, so that, that was awesome fishing, fishing down there, but it was like the James, you know, um, on steroids, uh, and, um, uh, had a good finish there. So it's a muddy river system, you know what I mean? Um, cypress trees and pads and all the things I love. Um, how do you break that uh, down when you've never been there? And I'm assuming, let's just say you didn't have a posse to help you break it down. That's a hell of a lot of water to go through. Yeah, it is. And back then is probably, probably the same would be true now, but back then, um, I bought every red river map I could find, you know, the paper maps. Um, I still would do that today if I'm going to go fish a new, new body water, I, because each map will have something a little bit different, different levels of detail, local, 
names of, of spots so that if you're reading a fishing report and it talks about the Bobo Hole on, on the Red River, um, you might be able to find that on one of the maps. Uh, and, you know, so it's, it's reading the, it's, it's doing your, putting your time in off the water before you get there, you know, off, um, most of the time I would try to already have, I tried not to go in with any pre preconceived notions, but I'd kind of have an idea of, of what I was going to, where I was going to start, um, going into it to, so I could, you know, avoid some of the mistakes I made early on, which was trying to fish everything, you know, can't do that on the red river. Um, so I, you know, um, uh, pick a, a pool and um, launch as close to it, you know, where I thought I would catch them as I could and just try to pick it apart. Um, down there, it's a lot, you know, um, you had so many different options, sort of like fish in Florida, you know, you got hyacinth or, or pads or, you know, different types of grass and cypress trees and all that. So you just try to land on sort of your, you know, the things you can eliminate, you know, um, but, but yeah, I think a lot of it was for me back in the day, you know, being in IT, um, I knew about the Google Earth uh, historical aerial, aerial images, you know, and and I would uh, try to use that to my advantage, you know, especially in spawn tournaments and stuff. Um, but, but yeah, it's it's the on and off the water research, right? How much different is it for all the title guys here fishing a river system that's non-title? Are you, so example guys, you can fish basically mad a woman and never leave it. And you've got two periods that you actually have a chance to, to, to really do some damage, but in a regular river system, you don't have the two tide swings. Are, are you having to run more water because the fish aren't as concentrated? Are they just as concentrated on tide? How does that play differently? That's a good question. Um, I think you have to, I, from my experience, I had to run more water, um, because the fish didn't replenish like you see them doing on the tidal water as much, right? Um, so especially holding up to a 225 boat field over three days, right? Um, if they're in the pads, you know, those those places are going to get pounded by, you know, people in practice, people stick in fish in practice, which drives me insane. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I think, yeah, you got to, you got to, yeah. I, I want to touch on that one point, which was, I do like the idea of limiting practice for professionals, just because I think the weights on the back end of the tournament would be a lot better. Yeah, agreed. But you, so you're saying eliminating practice altogether? No, like, so oh. back in the day where you could practice for a month and a half, straight, yeah, yeah, yeah. that I think is probably problem. should be toned down just a little bit. I agree. And I mean, on some level, I mean, it sucks. Let me tell you, it sucks when you know that the guys you're competing against have been on the lake for two weeks and you've been working, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and you, I mean, I think it's important to stay on top of the fish, you know, especially in transition times, like, you know, the spawn and, and post spawn and whatever, but, um, or any time, I guess, but, um, but yeah, I think that is a, but I think it can also screw people, you know, they, they can end up, um, fishing, chasing the fish from two weeks ago. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I think I've seen that happen a few times. Um, uh, but yeah, it, I think you're right. The weights would be better if you, if you had a, a cutoff, right? I, yeah. I mean, I think that would also show off some places, especially when you go to these smaller places, these, these really confined fisheries, when you have these massive fields and they just beat the absolute snot out of it. Um, and then, it, yeah, we, then we could always have the conversation about where they decide to go versus where they don't. I think that's, I think in recent years, that's more of a, more of an issue where, where, what is the one fishery in all your trials that you're like, I want to go back here a thousand times over this place is the shit. St. Lawrence river. 100%. Really? Like hands down, one hundred percent, yes, yeah. I keep saying that. My God, I really do have to go there. You have to get there. My God, and that, and in fact, this is extreme to say on some way. I mean, it's it's a culmination of things that led me to decide not to fish the opens. But um, the fish in the St. Lawrence River last time, and knowing that I wanted to be there at the right time of year for fun fishing, 
and knowing that I couldn't be because my schedule, you know, fishing and, and lack of vacation wouldn't allow it was another, was a major driver in my decision. I want to take my brother there. I want to go there with him, with my, mm. my husband and, and go can stay for two weeks if we want to, you know, and, and, and fish. And, uh, and so that's the kind of thing I haven't been able to do all mm-hmm. these years. Um, so, but yeah, St. Lawrence is insane. How hard was that to get comfortable with fishing and feeling like you have an idea of how to win there? Um, John Cruz helped me a lot. I talked to him. Um, you just, you know, I saw him at, at the Richmond fishing show and, and we were like talking and, and he gave, he gave me what I thought was a really good tip on how to uh, fish the current and uh, help me understand what it was to set a drift. And I, I had never done that before. Um, so so just that, you know, it, was, it might have seemed like a brief aside to him, but it was very helpful to me in helping me, um, you know, learn without, uh, if I had gone into that without knowing how to do a drift, then um, I think it would have taken me a lot longer and I might not have figured out what I did. Um there were fish up shallow too. I mean, I could have gotten out of the current and caught fish too, but um, I caught a six six pound eight ounce smallmouth in practice, biggest fish, big, biggest smallmouth of my life, and um, and it was on like I think it was six pound uh, fluoro, and uh, Jesus. Man, that was amazing. <laughs> oh my god, you should have seen the lip on that fish it was like oh. giant. Um, but uh, but so yeah, when you you know, and and that was on that same drift. I, I mean, I'm talking like a uh, thirty to fifty feet of water, uh, probably a thousand yards, you know, of you know, a block of area. You know what I mean? And uh, you know, the second day, I just I wish I had had. I, looking back on it after you talk to your buddies, you know, mm-hmm. uh, some of the local guys were fishing up there with me that that um, keyed me in on some things afterwards. If I had gone up shallow, I probably could have done really well in that tournament, but I tried to find more of those drift fish. And, and that's something that's interesting. When, when you mentioned the St. Lawrence and now bass goes there, like FLW used to go to Beaver like every single year and right. seeing more, I guess, unconventional guys winning up North. And I think it's because if you go there every year, you get a, a, a blueprint for the place. Um, do you feel like your strategies for there have changed or is the fishing changed up there from day one till now? Um, I have only been there a couple times, I think three times. Um, so, and the first time was, I think September, um, another time I think was June, um, one was July. Um, so, you know, the fishing's different, right? Um, I think the, the main difference, you know, from the first time and the last time I was there is just me expanding my, um, my, my, horizons, I guess, are the, the, um, type of fishing I was going to do, um, to, I mean, God, it's, it's so expansive. There's so many things you can do there. Um, and I kind of get lost in exploring, you know, I, I just, I love, um, finding a fish, you know? So, so just trying to expand on something you find and, and you want to be confident in that thing and you want to believe that's the spot. Right. Um, so I think for me, it was really just about expanding, um, not the distance from the launch necessarily, but the, the, um, area that I would, I would cover if that makes sense. No, that that's interesting. Cause I'm, I'm going to tie into my next thing. Did you, have you gotten uh, a lot of experience in Florida waters? Yeah. So let's say Okeechobee, massive, but fish is small. The St. Lawrence, is that kind of the same deal? Because it's like, oh my God, there's no. so much water. Okay. No, no. I think I would like, I would like in the St. Lawrence more to the Harris chain uh, oh, yeah. in Florida. Like okay. there's so many options on the Harris chain, but it, it can also fish small, right? But the St. Lawrence river, in my opinion, does not, I don't, I don't see that it could, unless unless the wind's a factor, uh, then I can see it at certain times of year, fish and small for sure. That would blow my mind then. Yeah. It, it's one thing when mentally you go into it, you think like it's going to fish tight, but when it's just, it could be anywhere. Oh my God. Yeah. I have a meltdown. Oh, yeah. yeah, man. <laughs> yeah. It can make your head explode. And you just have to, you know, 
put a game plan together, right? And stick with it, I think. Um, it, it, and that that to me is a tough one because it's like, when, if your gut tells you to change it up, even, even if it's late on day two of the tournament and you had a game plan, you still got to know when you trust your gut and, and just throw everything out the window, you know? How do you trust your gut to do that? Because mine doesn't work. Or it's yeah. you, you, I, I think for me, it ended up being when I'm sucking, when the wheels are coming off, that's that's when it's time, you know. And uh, don't wait a second longer <laughs> when you recognize that, you know. When you're kind of when there's that long lull and you've moved a couple times and you're not you're not putting it together. Um, to me, that's when you just got to say, you know what? Let me try something different. Let me just you know fish my strengths and and you know not throw it all out, but you know try to mix some other things in, you know. Guys, that's just such wise words of wisdom because it is so freaking hard to me to do that. It is, Luckily, very hard. It is especially with tech. I, this is where we always talk about the um, <clears throat> the negatives of forward facing sonar. Um, one that it's just the information that hits you. And this is my first year I ran it. First year I ran it, and it's like I wanted to force things more than I thought because if you show up at a point, you're gonna throw your jerk bait and then you're done. But now that you see them down there, it's almost like spawn fishing 24 seven and it's learning when to ignore all this great information and go back to guts and okay, we're going to do this instead. It's, it's fascinating. I agree with you. And, and I think, um, the, the people who are just learning with that technology available to them will have different challenges than we had, um, you know, uh, learning to fish without it. Right. Um, just like the guys that fish with flashers, uh, you know, they have a different next level skill set that we just can't even probably relate to, right? Just from, from those years of instinctive fishing, right? Um, I think, um, maybe using a, a pole to, you know, or a stick to drag and feel for rock, you know, <laughs> stuff like that or whatever, you know, um, just different, you know, so I think I'm hoping that, um, maybe in, in college and, you know, just in practice, guys will force themselves to turn off their electronics sometimes and, and, you know, do it, do it the old way. <laughs> I think they'll have to be, I mean, the more and more guides I have on the show, more of my friends, they're saying like, when you shine that cancer beam at them, they're turning away. And it's not like it was, it's almost like when, um, when, when the Alabama rig came on the scene and you could catch a hundred pounds in one cast. And now it's like, if you get one or two, you're lucky. Yeah. I think forward facing sonar might just become a tool and it won't be, it'll be important, but it won't be as hot as initially it was. Sure. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, the fish are, the fish become wise to things quickly. Just like, you know, they talk about, um, old, lures that used to work working again after they go out of style, you know, same concept, I think, you know, mm -hmm. new fish are seeing them now that didn't learn about them. You know what I mean? Um, the big swim baits, you know, it, it's cool to see the Potomac river coming back so that now you, you can catch fish on a big swim bait again. It's been a long time. Um, but I think the fish that learned about that and, and became wise to it aren't there anymore, you know? And it's also, I think it baits, it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy with baits where it, it's hot. So more people fish them, therefore more yes. catch. So they become hot. And it's this big bait culture, whatever it was, you're getting more people throwing them. Therefore, yeah, more people are going to eventually stick a nice one and it kind of fulfills yeah. the prophecy. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah, but you know, talking about the St. Lawrence river, I think, 250 guys could throw a drop shot up there all day and, and not really, I mean, yeah, eventually you're going to hurt the, the numbers. Right. Um, but it just, it just seems like that, that good of a fishery, at least right now to me. Oh, I, I think it's, um, and that's where I was trying to, um, and we talked about John Edinger. That's where I tried to, uh, to nail him down with that, where it talks about invasive species. And he's like, look, not all invasives are created equally. Like what they have up there is a freaky circumstance. that's made a Jurassic park, basically. Um, definitely. definitely everyone should go get up, get up there and look at that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Who knows what, what the future holds for that, but right now it's the place to be <laughs> Gunner, You know, if you asked me 10 years ago, I probably would have said Gunnersville, but I hadn't been to St. Lawrence river then either. So yeah. I think you can catch, uh, I have to look at the stats, but I mean, they were breaking century belts up there. 
with smallmouth. That wasn't heard of 10, yeah. 15 years ago. Isn't that amazing? I know. It's a, it's an awesome time to be be alive. <laughs> but uh, yeah. you know, it, you know, I mentioned Gunnersville. You remember when Chickamauga was like on fire mm -hmm. a few years ago? Yeah. Uh, that was such a weird situation. Like they built an entire like hotels and, and restaurants around the fact that that fishery was so good. And I mean, maybe it still is, but is anybody talking about it? You know, it's is it because the majors aren't going there, which is good, you know, grass is being sprayed by all the locals. Um, oh, is it? I, I, I did not know that. Yeah. I cover on the downland. That's my passion is talking about SAV and like okay. over there, they just, they, you have a lot of homeowners starting to spray it. Um, so you have that, you have possibly a fish virus going on as well. And that's creating a lot of issues. Um, I mean, it's also, we also have the Alabama bass invasion. That's really hurting the whole TVA right. system right now. Yeah. <clears throat> Consequently yeah. though, you know, guys just to get too nerdy with biology. They're finding out that Alabama bass can't handle vegetation. And that's mm. why Gunnersville does not have the Alabama bass issue that all the other places does is because of the vegetation. So it, it's interesting that these places that want to spray, but also don't want Alabama bass, having hydrilla might actually fix some of these issues. That's very cool. I had no idea. Yeah. It, yeah. It's just, it's so interesting about all these invasives. I think Kerr Reservoir, Bugs Island, if they would allow hydrilla to flourish in there a little bit more, I think a lot of the ailments would go away. Hydrilla specifically or milfoil? Any, whatever you can get to any, grow. Any, <laughs> yes. I'll take milfoil all day over it, but. Oh, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. It's just like, I know like a lot of times hydrilla will grow in places that the others won't. Um, sure. Yep. And I don't know, yeah. again, guys, like go, go listen to this Odenkirk episode. Cause that is fascinating. The more I learned about that and grass carp and how bad that was mm -hmm. back in the day. Oh my God. Yes, absolutely. Well, when you were fishing like Anna, like what were the weights back then? Cause I know Odenkirk is really <laughs> hyping up now and probably me too, about how much better like Anna is now. I mean, would you agree like it's fishing better now than it was? Or? Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, when I look, when I think about my history with Lake Anna, um, the, the small clubs that I was fishing with and, um, LAPR was one, you'd have a handful of guys who always had them. Right. That's oh, always going to be the case. But, um, but I think back then the weights on Anna would go, would dra drop drastically after the top three or four, you know, um, to nothing. Right. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's night and day difference, I think, now um, versus what it was, you know, 15 years ago. Do you think they could, a uh, BFL could be held on that place? It could be, but I, I wouldn't want to fish it. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Just too, it's too small in my, in my opinion, you know. Um, I'm grouchy now. I'm a grouchy old lady now. I don't like... <laughs> I don't like people being on my spot when I get there, <laughs> you know? You get spoiled with such big bodies of water. I remember fishing a BFL on Indian Lake in Ohio, and it's 5,000 acres for 200 oh bucks. And it's just yeah. like, when you have these massive places, you get spoiled to it. Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I just am trying to get off Kerr a little bit more and get some other places kind of into the mix. <laughs> yeah. I even think Gaston's a little small, you know? But, um, but I mean... You know, I, I think a BFL would be fine on Anna, but I just, I, I probably wouldn't want to fish it. <laughs> Is Smith too small? No. I wonder, okay, now you, gotta... wait, 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 you're saying Smith BFL. Lake on... Uh, oh, oh Quantico? Smith Mountain, uh, Virginia. Smith Mountain, okay. I was like, <laughs> have you fished Smith Lake on Quantico? Oh my goodness. Smith Mountain with that. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing is like Gaston. I just think that they need a better marina first and foremost. Um, yeah. To even yeah, host absolutely. Something like that. Yeah, that, it seemed like they could really modify that, but I, I guess they don't feel like they need to, right? They still get the boats, but, um, but yeah, I, I mean, they could desperately use a, a better facility there. But, um, but no, uh, Smith Mountain Lake. I mean, to me, that's a massive. What's how big is that lake? I think it's twenty. You know what? Now I should I should have this memorized, but I don't. Smith yeah, Mountain Lake. I don't remember. All right, we're gonna find out right now. Okay. It is acreage. Acres. Twenty. Wow, it's only twenty thousand acres. Smith Mountain That's, Lake. Are is you kidding me? Yeah, twenty thousand six hundred. And uh, so Anna's like twelve thousand, right? 
that's only nine. And that's the, okay. um, it's, it's like 13 or 14 total, but you have the private side. It's only 9,000. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can't believe, um, yeah, I can't believe Smith Mountain Lake is only 20,000. That's awesome. Yeah, 20,000. But, but yeah, that, you know, that's a, that's one of the other things about the lakes like that. Um, you can hide, you know? Um, so oh. it doesn't, you don't feel the pressure as much, I think. Um, uh, so yeah, I love that lake. And, and that's, what's interesting to me from a, a, as a guy that's been a Northern Virginian, you fish the Potomac and a lot of, a lot of times of the year, that place is, it fishes super small. You're going to be up on top of each other. It's like being on I-95 on traffic yeah. jam. Yeah. And so I actually feel kind of comfortable fishing tight because I, I, I mentally, it doesn't bother me because I grew right. up in, if yeah. I go to Florida, if I go anywhere like that, mentally, it's fine. When I go yeah. to a place like a Kerr, where it's a yeah. hundred billion acres, yeah. I that almost blows my mind because I don't yeah. know where to start. Right. Yeah. And it's funny because the guys that grew up fishing a Kerr or, you know, some of the Alabama lakes and stuff, if they see somebody, you know, <laughs> within 200 yards of them, they're losing their crap, you know? Um, and, and it's like, we're, we're used to like talking like you and I are talking to the mm-hmm. next boat, you know, and five other boats around you. Right. Um, so, you know, you got to kind of be able to uh, keep that in mind if you're, if you're fishing the same area as somebody else, I guess. But, but yeah, that's one of the things I love the most about a cur. It's like, you don't, I, I like not seeing another boat <laughs> because, because then it, again, it's just, okay, I'm going to scan this point or whatever, look for this hump and, and not have to worry about five boats being right there. You know what I mean? And it, that's, to me, that's like at the core of it. That's like the whole reason I'm out there is, is, um, the, the peace and the solitude kind of stuff, you know, um, that, that to me is what, you know, it's a big draw for me for fishing. And that's why I think I love, um, especially practicing for the, um, the, uh, pairing events, you know, and not, and, you know, somebody told me a long time ago that I shoot myself in the foot by not practicing with a partner or with a, you know, a co-angler. I'm like, I, I know it's hard for me to get one, but I also kind of love fishing alone. <laughs> that, have you always had that mindset of, I, I like to have in like not an area to myself, not seeing people or was that cultivated since you got to fish nationally compared to like when you were a, a for lack of a better term, a river rat. And you, that's just I, what it was. I think, I think, um, I've always felt that way looking back on it. Like, and even, you know, fishing the river, like, you know, you know, there's going to be 50 people at Acapo, but it it still sucks when they show up. (laughs) So um, I just want it all to myself. (laughs) How did you handle that in your Florida tournament son? Cause like that, that place notoriously, if you try to get away from the crowd, you either will win or go zero. Like there's no point. That's yeah. That's what I did. (laughs) No, no, I I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily um, not go to where the crowds were. Like I, I know that that's a thing, you know, you, um, that's where the fish are sometimes. And, um, but I, I think it's, for me, it's a ADD problem with, with Florida because everything looks so damn good and you just want to, f- and it, it all looks good. You know, you can find the right depth of water, what feels like the right depth of water and the right, you know, size patch of pads, the three pads together by themselves, you know, and, um, and find those for days and, or find the toolies and the, you know, whatever you want to fish. And, um, I just get lost in that, I think, you know, and, and so I, I, I've always had trouble patterning those, those fisheries. Um, and I think that's why it's just, again, trying to, trying to do too much with a small amount of time, you know? Yeah, the, the, those places are so fascinating to me. And it's so fascinating how those guys can come up here on the Potomac every damn time and cash a check. Like, <laughs> and I truly believe after talking to a bunch of them that have won the Toyotas up here, it's they're okay with fishing a crowd. They'll be like, okay, I need to stay in the back of Belmont with a crowd. That's fine. I'll just punch yeah. one strip and I'll be okay. Yeah. It doesn't bother them. Yeah. But I think they also sort of like the concept of the guys who grew up, um, uh, fishing docks, you know, skipping docks. That's just how they grew up fishing. So the guys in Florida, 
they know how to eliminate the different types of vegetation or the, you know, and so when they come to a Potomac, they've got five fewer choices than they did, you know, and in, in the types of vegetation to focus on. So it's a lot, it's, it's a five times easier for them maybe to, to figure out their pattern, you know? Oh, maybe hundred percent. I think that's what it is. And that's where you can really learn. I think from the different styles from Japanese anglers, California northerners and, and people that grew up in Florida, just picking up on those little things and, and adding it to your, to your toolbox. Absolutely. It's so freaking important. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I love, I love, um, that another great thing about fishing, you know, the opens is, you know, kind of opposite of what I was just talking about, being able to watch a Japanese angler fish, you know, it's, it's hard if you're on tournament day and you, you're near each other, it's hard to focus on what you're doing because you're, you know, you want to watch them. Um, at least the ones, it was funny the last few years, there, there was one, um, one of the depths boats uh, that seemed like we were always in the same place. I swear to you on the last open on, um, on Kerr, first spot I go to in the morning, there he is like 300 yards away from me. I'm like, damn. But, but also it, it makes you feel like you figured something out too. Cause he's, yeah. Like, yeah. He's just behind him, you know, <laughs> that, that's yeah. what's to me. There's a confidence thing. When a boat shows up at your spot, it's like, okay, it might work. But if you show up yeah. and no one else is there, it's like, I either figured this out or I'm going to suck today. <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> what are those Japanese anglers like, um, their style or techniques or just or what experience you have with them? Yeah. So, um, there's been a couple standouts in my mind and I, I'm horrible with names, but yeah. it wouldn't matter anyway. But um, on, um, I think it was Cherokee Lake. I was in in a backwater area, and I could see this um, one angler coming in, and he had a, you know his co angler on the back of the boat, and he fished the entire like it's a windy cove, you know, mountainous cove. Um, with all these little nooks and crannies, he covered every inch of that thing in the time it took me to fish. Like I fish slow. <laughs> so he covered the entire thing so fast and so methodically. And like, wow, the, the guy on the back of the boat might say something to him. He he's in his own little world, you know, and he's out gone. And I was like, okay, well, I guess there's no fish back here. So, <laughs> you know, um, and then the, uh, all, uh, the other, um, flip side of that, I guess, is, um, just the watch, watching the way they, and you just want to get a pair of binoculars out and look at the lure they're using. It's a mm. tiny little, whatever it is. And, um, just fishing real slow and methodical with the electronics and, and, uh, and just, there's nothing else around. It's just, there can be boats bumping into them and they're not even going to be paying attention. You know what I mean? It seems like they have no problem with boating pressure at all. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. so interesting where they will win on spots and everyone's like oh yeah that's a good spot but it's getting pounded they do not care if there's twenty yeah. thousand. they will catch them behind you every time yeah yeah and it's yeah. it's weird because so many of their techniques do eventually make it over here and they become popular but i don't think their mindset has caught on with a lot of anglers and we keep hearing from so many shows and and media outlets the pressure on the water and i'm wondering when a lot more american anglers will catch on to their thought process not just their techniques of dealing with pressured fisheries because it's only going to get worse yeah yeah you're you're 100 right and i think that they they do well by not trying to what what i perceive as not trying to um network with the American anglers, you know what I mean? <laughs> They're with, each, they, they hang with each other and they, you know, um, they have their own network and, and yeah, I think that's going to be a necessary, um, uh, eventuality, right. Especially like, like you said, with, um, with the fish becoming shy to the, to the scope and stuff like that. Yeah. It, it's, it's only going to get, it's only going to get worse guys. So just always think about that. Like, don't be afraid to move away. From, don't be afraid to be in the crowd sometimes and be able to fish, learn how to fish pressured waters. Don't just try to like get away from it because that's how you're going to cash checks as you try to advance your guys' career. Um, yeah. And if I, you know, if I think about with, you know, thinking about fish being shot of the scope or whatever, um, if you're catching fish on that technique and you don't stop and think about why they're there and look around and think about, you know, how could I go replicate this somewhere else? 
um, and then consider turning your electronics off and seeing if you can catch them better, then you're missing an opportunity, you know? Thinking outside the box, even with all the technology, it's always trying to think outside the box. And that was something yeah. that really, I mean, you can do that, whether it's a professional college, high school level. Um, God, it's so crazy. I can even say high school fishing right now. And that's actually yeah. a, a segue. Honestly, is there with high school and college, is, is there more opportunities for, for female anglers now because there's high school and college or what is that circumstance like, especially in Virginia? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, uh, Becky Gore started the as our, as i recall she started the orange county fishing club um and i think that was the very first one right uh mm -hmm. and so i've you know met some cool cool people through through that club over the years and um and two girls were fishing that club um a long time ago and i think if that club hadn't existed they might not have done it and i think that that holds true for a lot of the um the girls across the country um I, one of my best friends, Michelle Armstrong, her daughter uh, fishes for col a college team now, and she started in high school. And um, and I think that the, those, while there's nothing keeping a girl from fishing ever, right? Um, the uh, that that avenue makes it uh, more comfortable for girls. Um, it makes them feel like less uh, apprehensive about taking that step, and and you know getting in the boat with somebody. So, um, and it's also a safe space, right? Um, a parent, the parents are going to feel more comfortable, uh, knowing that there's a, there's a, you know, an organization and coaches and, um, you know, things like that to, to help ensure that the girl, their, their girls are safe when they're on the water. So, yeah. What kind of programs are there that are locally for, 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 husbands for for dads for moms to, to get their daughters into fishing around here you know especially i'm thinking like the northern virginia type of area because i feel like this is a perfect spot for one yeah um take me fishing i think is a is the first thing that pops into my mind we've had other organizations like becoming an outdoors woman um that was a cool organization that um i um chris donovan uh invited me to, to get involved with that years ago um in virginia and that was a great experience and you know mothers and daughters you know um all kinds of girls were there um there's another organization uh, you may know of it it's um they have events uh out of national harbor i don't know if they've done it in the last couple of years since the pandemic but um if i can think of the name of it i'll send it to you we can put it in the comments maybe um Absolutely. or the description but um but it it was a high school focused especially for um i think it was more dc region focused in northern virginia um an opportunity to take kids out fishing um so it um I, got, I wish I could remember, remember the name of it, but I think Take Me Fishing um, is a is a major one. Um, they, you know, have connections to a lot of the different organizations too. So um, that's the the primary one I think about. Is that something that they really need to think about doing? Is is throwing more money into this area? Because I feel like again, if you, for you guys that are from like Southern Virginia, you don't know <laughs> Loudoun County, Northern Virginia, they they got some money, and I feel like this yeah. is like great place to get something started or just to, to really bolster it. Yeah, I think it is. I mean, especially with the population and the, the diverse fisheries that we have in the area, you know, um, I think 4-H is another one that just popped in my, my mind, but that's, you know, that's an, uh, another, I mean, um, I thought about that because of Burke Lake in Fairfax. Uh, I'm not sure why I thought of 4-H when I thought of Burke Lake, but um, but uh, I think that they have some kind of activities out on that lake, and that's a good lake for to get people out on in a you know smaller, uh, safer kind of you know environment where the water's not real deep or, or dangerous. Um, so yeah, but I think I think if we can. Um, I think it's not as much about the money being dumped into it to, to me as it is people being willing to, to, um, to, um, volunteer, to, to give their time, to, um, take kids out fishing and, and, yeah. you know, um, not just fish from the bank, you know, that's great too. But, um, being able to get out on a boat, I think is next level, you know, especially for people who are, who are considering doing it in high school or college. Right. Yeah. 
so hard to find volunteers. If it wasn't for um, the volunteers, you know, like Becky, I've been, I was out on the boat with her a thousand years ago and it wasn't for people like them to actually take the time out of their schedule, but it is, it's hard with gas and everything and a boat costing $6 million. It's the world has changed a lot, even since I was a kid. It's insane. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, what's great though, I think is um, the, the normalization of aluminum boats, <laughs> like, you know, these are, this is an affordable option and uh, it, it's, it's making the sport a lot more accessible, I think, for a much wide, uh, broader audience as well as kayaks, right? Um, uh, you know, just get whatever you can, paddleboard, whatever, and get on the water, right? <laughs> but I agree. And it's regional too. So I have a lot of guys when I do my live streams on my night and they're like, I'm in Ashburn, which is, if you guys don't know, Ashburn, well, I think it would suck to live there, but it's just a bunch of tight houses together. And they're like, I can't put a 21 foot boat, but I can have a kayak. Yeah. And it does give another avenue for people to get into it um, and be competitive too yes. in the world of fishing. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look at you, Christine Fisher. I mean, oh God, yeah. you know, <laughs> talk about girl, you know, a good role model for girls in fishing. Um, she's incredible and look at how successful she's become just, you know, fishing from a kayak. So any, yeah, there's, there's so many options now. So what are you going to be, what, what are your plans for 2024? Um, so I think for 2024, um, still going to be competing in the Virginia Elite 70 with my brother um, in a couple tournaments. I'm not going to fish all of them with him, but um, going to go to the St. Lawrence River. Awesome. With, you know, with my family and um, spend at least a week up there catching giant smallmouth and uh and then really just try to expand the on the ideas of um, you know finding ways to encourage girls to to fish um, through the YouTube channel through my connections um, that you know with Green Top uh, Sporting Goods I um, there's a, a young female um, youth ambassador there um, who's in who she's just loves hunting and fishing and we went fishing on Lake Anna earlier this year. Um, I'll hopefully take her out again, get, you know, connect with her and see if, you know, um, we can try to build that organization a little bit for girls and fishing and, and young people, you know, I think my YouTube channel, I'm going to try to focus on getting some footage of, you know, some of the basics, you know, a lot of YouTube channels do the basics about, you know, loading the boat and, um, maintenance on the trailer and, you know, just, back in the, the, the boat in the water and stuff like that. But, um, I think even changing a tire on the trailer is a, is a thing that will, if, if women who, not just girls, but women who are considering, uh, competing in tournaments are not doing it because they feel intimidated because they don't know how to do some of these things. I feel like, you know, maybe I can help them, um, I've, I've talked to a lot of women over the years uh, at weigh-ins. There's always that one woman who's clapping in the stands for me when I'm weighing in my fish and, and you know, talk to them. And they're like, I, I would love to do it. I'm just too nervous. I, I want to help them not feel nervous. And, um, and maybe through that, um, you know, YouTube channel, I can help with that. And then, guys, as always, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today. Um, is there anything else that we haven't mentioned or is there any sponsors or anything like that you'd like to give a shout out to? I mean, definitely shout out to Mare, Mare Marine, Mare Requia, you know, they're the, I mean, they've been with me, you know, and, and I've been with them since long ago. Um, and um, I think, I mean, I mentioned Green Top. Those are the main uh, partners I have uh, at this point. And um, I, I, yeah, I think we covered a lot and I, I really appreciate you having me on the show. And uh, maybe if, if I think of something more interesting to talk about, we can do it again sometime. Oh, ab absolutely. I mean, guys, as always, as I say, all I have to do is go downstairs and turn a camera on. So I'm always available if, if you want to chat about anything that you have coming up. Um, and then, guys, I know this is a broken record, but I always have to say it twice. Link in the episode description, everything we talked about today, including to Green Top and uh, Mara Marine. Um, please, guys, like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out in the algorithm. Uh, please check us out on Apple and Spotify. We're actually the number one fishing show in the greater DMV metropolitan area. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle. 
located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.